Shana Haba the Yerushalayim Next year in Jerusalem Over there, over there in the Welcome to Theology in Perspective, the Bible teaching ministry of Dr. Daniel Woodhead. Welcome back. This is Theology in Perspective, and I'm Dr. Daniel Woodhead. I am blessed that you could join us again for another session of looking deeply into the Word of God, our Bible. Today I want to begin a series that's going to talk about immortality. What does the Bible have to teach us about living forever? And that's our bodies and our spirit. So let's begin. The Bible does speak of eternal life beyond this life when we leave these bodies that we now inhabit. Several verses that speak to this are, for example, John 3.16, John 6.68, 6, 2 Timothy 1, 9 through 10, Jude 21, and a host of others. We're going to explore these over our next several sessions. Uh, in John 6.68, 6, the Lord himself said to Simon Peter, after, well, first of all, let's look what Simon Peter says. Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Jesus talked about eternal life. In 2 Timothy 1, verses 9 to 10, the text there says, Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now Jesus, last name, now this is not his surname like we would have, but his title is Christ, and we call him Jesus Christ. It's exactly Jesus the Christ, or the Messiah, which is the Hebrew term. Now he came from God, he is God, and he left eternity to come into this earth for specific purposes. Now we believe, because the Bible teaches that, that if we accept the gospel of Jesus Christ, that is, he died, went into the ground, and three days later he rose from the dead, that we will live forever. 1 John 5.13, John 10.27 and 28, Romans 5.21, and a host of other verses. Let's just look at John, 1 John 5.13. These things have I written unto you, that you may believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. John 10, verses 27 to 28 say, My sheep hear my voice. Now this is the Lord Jesus talking, and I know them. They follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Finally, I'm going to end here with Romans 5.21 for this section of this, this course, if you will. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So let's look a lot deeper into this. What exactly do the terms eternal life and immortality mean? Now let's define uh, eternal and forever, for example. It's important to realize that God does not exist in a place where time goes on forever. God lives in a place where there is no time. And that's almost impossible for human beings to understand. We can't conceptualize these things. In 2 Timothy 1, verse 9, the Apostle Paul makes a statement that God's grace was given us in Christ Jesus 
before the beginning of time. Now, a study of this Greek phrase within those verses there, it's called prochronion aeonion, and it translates before the beginning of time. And it shows the independent existence of God's grace in Christ outside of our time domain. It also shows us that God lives in this no time domain, whereas we live in the time domain. You know, it's almost impossible to comprehend this because we have finite minds and we're humans. We're not God and we live in his creation. Time, space, and matter are the components of where we live. But we still have to try and keep this in mind that God lives outside of this. He doesn't live a long ways away where we can go out in a spaceship and travel for some number of light years and we'll get to heaven. Heaven is in other dimensions outside of our time domain. So try and keep that in mind, even though we can't conceptualize it, and I understand that, but we have to keep thinking, God is in heaven, heaven is outside of time and space, and it's in other dimensions than the four that we have, and he lives there, Jesus is there, Jesus came from there, visited earth, gave his life intentionally, to provide the salvation that we need as sinful human beings to be with him when we leave these bodies. Now I want to talk about immortality, which is really the general subject of this series that we're entering. Immortality is simply the eternal, continuous, and conscious existence of the soul after the death of the body. Within the Bible, the term immortality is used in the Bible only, generally, but theology proper, in other words, talking about God himself, uses the term as applied to both the body and the soul. But for the purposes of what we're going to be doing here, we're going to focus on the continuous consciousness of the soul, spirit, or the immaterial part of the human body after it ceases to live. What's inside of us? What does our thinking, us that feels, that knows, that wants, that has desires, our soul, if you will, goes on forever. It lives eternal forever. So we need to understand that. And we need to understand that God in Christ is allowing us to live eternally. Now there are at least 16 specific evidences for the doctrine of immortality in the Bible. There's also three major benefits to us within this doctrine. So we need to understand this. Now we're going to briefly examine each one of these 16 evidences uh, and then we're going to conclude with the three benefits that God has for us. A little later on in our series here, we're going to do examine the, the doctrine of resurrection or the raising up of the dead to eternal life with new bodies as well as the intermediate stage between death and resurrection. Now, the intermediate stage is between the time when a saint, that's a believer, dies and the rapture of the church occurs. We don't, we don't get clothed with our new bodies until after the rapture. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 53 to 54, speaks of putting on immortality. And the body puts on immortality at the rapture of the church. I'm going to talk about the rapture in a little while and what that is and how God is going to come back here in Christ, while still in the air, he's going to take the believers out of this world. That's from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, the immediate, in terms of this body, does not refer to the unbiblical doctrine of purgatory. That heresy was developed in the Middle Ages after paganism was introduced into the Christian church. 
there's no biblical evidence for purgatory. You're either absent from the body and present with the Lord, or present with the body, present with the Lord and absent from the body. That's what the Bible teaches. We go straight to God. Now, there are topics of evidence here that we need to look at. Uh, the concept that we see in the Old Testament is a figure of speech called gathered to his people. And it refers to death in the Old Testament. First, the physical death takes place. And after that, the individual is seen as entering a company that had gone on before him, gathered to his people. So a dead person is seen as joining a company of people that preceded him in death. Now the first verse that declares this is at the death of Abraham. We see this in Genesis 25, verse 8. And the text there says, And then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. Now the same statement is made of Ishmael, his son, by the concubine. Genesis 25, 17. And these are the years of the life of Ishmael, a hundred and thirty and seven years. And he gave up the ghost and died and was gathered unto his people. Another example is Genesis 35, 29, part A. And Isaac gave up the ghost and died and was gathered unto his people. Now here's another one. It's from about Jacob, life of Jacob, Genesis 49, 29. And he charged them and said unto them, I am to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite. So the last example is in Genesis 49.33, where it says, And when Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet unto the bed and yielded up the ghost, and was gathered unto his people. So you can see in the first book of the Bible, after people die physically, they are said to be gathered to their people. They're seen as joining some company of people that preceded them on whom they are conscious. Now let's think through that. They're conscious. They see them. They know who's there. Some see this phrase of just simply dying and being buried in a cemetery, but that's not true. <coughs> Excuse me, because Abraham, cemetery is back in Haran. It's over in Mesopotamia, not there in Israel. Now let's look at the concept of joined to the fathers. That's the second evidence of the doctrine of immortality. And it's similar to the first. The expression joined to the fathers is used in several verses in Genesis. And here's one, Genesis 15, 15. God himself is speaking to Abraham and he says, And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. So it's important to notice that joining of the fathers precedes the burial itself. So the body dies, and then the spirit goes to join those that went on before. There's a similar statement that's made in Genesis 47, verse 30. But I will lie with my fathers, and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. So the fact that one goes on to join his fathers is also an implication that consciousness continues even after physical death. Now the fathers we're referring to are other generations. The Hebrew word for father is av, av, and it's also the same word used for grandfather, great-grandfather, and so on, and generations back. So joined to his fathers is that word, that Hebrew word talking about those that have gone on, not just one person. So let's look at one Old Testament saint that died before, well actually didn't die, he was raptured. Now Enoch didn't die. He left and continued to exist someplace. In the Old Testament, now this is discussed in Genesis 5.24 and it's a reaffirmation in the New Testament uh, that we see in Hebrews 11.5 of continuous existence 
beyond these lives, beyond these finite lives. Job also got assurance. Old Testament book of Job, he got assurance. And this is the fourth evidence, I would say, for the doctrine of immortality. And it's found in Job's book. And it records Job's assurance based on a question that he raised with God. And it was answered. So, for example, in Job 14, 14, the question is, If a man die, shall he live again? And it gets answered in chapter 19, 25 to 26. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand in the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. So Job had this assurance that even though his physical body will eventually <clears throat> go into physical death, He's going to see God when he's apart from his body. See, the Bible refers to us as our souls, not just our bodies. That's us. That's you inside that body. That's you. So let's look at the doctrine of the resurrection here. And within the doctrine of immortality, we see this doctrine of resurrection. Now, the very act of resurrection, it implies immortality because when a person is resurrected, he or she lives forever. Resurrection is not just coming back for life. Some of our Bible translations misuse that word, our English translations, because it's uh, inaccurate to say somebody that comes back from life has been resurrected. No. You know, if somebody dies on an operating table and they resuscitate him, he hasn't been resurrected. He just came back to life. He'll finish out his normal life and then his body will fail and he will be released from the body. A resurrection, though, is like what happened to the Lord Jesus. He came back three days after his crucifixion and he had an immortal body. It, it was special. It denied the and was outside the bounds of time and space. The Lord Jesus could pass through walls. He could appear, disappear. Supernatural powers, more so than he had <clears throat> when he was here before the crucifixion. Now, we will be raised to live forever. Now, in the Old Testament, this doctrine is found in Isaiah 26, 19, Daniel 12, 2 to 3, and Hosea 13, 14. In the New Testament, it's clearly expressed in John chapter 5, verses 25 to 29, and Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 to 6, and 11 to 15. Now, we're going to look at that a little later on, and we're going to see what that does and how it works. But for now, I want to move on, talk about the consciousness of the soul. Because the sixth evidence for this doctrine of immortality is that according to the scripture, the immaterial part of man is viewed as being with God upon death, but he's conscious. It's not like we're asleep and we don't realize things and we don't know what's taking place. We are totally aware, more aware than we have ever been here. Now, there are examples of this truth in both Old Testament and New Testament. The Old Testament expresses this doctrine in at least the following three verses that I'm going to recite for you. First one is Psalm 17, 15. As for me, I will behold the face in righteousness. I will be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Now, that's David speaking. King David expressing a real faith that the soul will still be conscious in the fellowship with God and other believers even after death. It's also taught in Psalm 73. Now listen to this one, verses 23 to 25. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee, Thou hast holden me by my right hand, thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I heard in heaven? 
but thee. And there is none upon earth that I desire besides thee. Now in this psalm, the psalmist uh, is a man named Asaph, and he expresses a real faith at immortality. Even upon his death, he saw himself as being with God and conscious. Now let's look at Ecclesiastes 12, 7, written by Solomon, the wisest and richest man that has ever lived. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Now, Solomon is expressing this truth that the body returns to the earth, it decays, and it goes back to dust. But the Spirit goes on to live with our Creator, the Lord Jesus. Now, in number seven in these evidences for this immortality, we see that David is expected to be able to join his dead son that he had with Bathsheba after his own death. And this is found in 2 Samuel 12, 23. Now, you remember the story? He had a son with Bathsheba. It was an immoral union. And because of that, the Lord, even though David, <clears throat> excuse me, repented, the Lord brought a lot of problems into David's life. He took the life of this baby, too. And after David mourned and uh, tried to revive the baby through prayer, and it was clear God was not going to let the baby live, David says, but now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. So David knows he's going to be able to go to him. And it's a place where his dead son is, and he's going to join him in a conscious manner. You know, the New Testament expresses the same concept in at least four different spots. They're found in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 to 8, Luke 23, 43, John 14, 23, and Philippians 1, 22 to 23. There is a concept in the Old Testament of Sheol, and in the New Testament it's called Hades. It's a place where the dead went before heaven was opened. Now, Sheol has multiple compartments. There's good compartments and there's bad compartments. The eighth evidence that we're going to look at here for the doctrine of immortality is seeing that the shoal, the, excuse me, the souls in Sheol are seen in continuous consciousness. In other words, they're always aware of what's taking place. <clears throat> Here's a good example we find in Isaiah 14, 9 to 11. The text there says, Sheol from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirred up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. All they shall speak and say unto thee, are you also become weak as we? Are you become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to Sheol, and the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread underneath, and the worms cover thee. Now this is talking about <clears throat> the king of Babylon entering into the hell section of Sheol itself, and all the souls that preceded him in hell suddenly rise to astonishment as they see this one that was a king, a leader, <clears throat> and they see him entering the domains of hell. But they're able to ask questions and carry on a conversation. Now, it can't be missed here. <clears throat> These dead ones are portrayed as being conscious. Same concept is taught in the New Testament, Luke 16, verses 19 to 31. This is about the rich man and Lazarus. It's a story that Jesus told, and it is not a parable, because parables do not name specific places and name specific people. This does. The rich man and a beggar Lazarus both die. They both go into Sheol, and they're both with Father Abraham. Lazarus, the beggar, who love God is with Abraham in paradise, and Lazarus, or excuse me, the rich man who did not love God and did not 
do anything other than serve himself is in the bad side of shield, the hell side, and they talk to each other. Now, I want to talk about another concept here that each one of us must realize, and it's the eternity in our heart. Now, the ninth evidence here is set in Ecclesiastes 3.1, where that text says, He, meaning God, has set eternity in their heart. Now, the word heart, uh, lev, uh, lev in Hebrew, is frequently used as one of the facets of the immaterial part of mankind. So it's, it's contained in our heart. The immaterial part of man is the element of immortality. Eternity. God set it in our hearts. God established eternity and he let us know about it in our soul. We can't conceive of the lights going out and not knowing, not thinking, not seeing, not being aware. Oh, when we get sick and we get infirmed and we get very aged, we can consider the bodies. Uh, going, but we know we're not going to sleep. We have that consciousness, and that's this setting eternity in our hearts. We need to pay attention to that because this is key to understanding this whole concept. Now, I'm going to close with the uh, concept of the Old Testament judge, the last judge, Samuel. He was seen as being conscious after his own death. Uh, the story is related to us in uh, 1 Samuel 28, verses 8 to 19. And Saul the king, in violation of the Mosaic law, the Bible, in violation of his own rules, goes to this witch in the area of Endor. Now, witches don't really have the ability to bring somebody back from the dead. These seances and that stuff, it's just sleight of hand. It's a deception. They can't really do this. But in this passage, Saul and his son Jonathan want to know if the battle that they're going into with the Philistines is going to result in a victory for them. They want to talk to Samuel. They want to bring him back from the dead. And the real Samuel comes back from the dead. And then the witch is really surprised. She didn't expect it to happen. God's intervention in this request is how the soul of Samuel came back. So his immaterial part was brought up from Sheol. And the issue here is that Samuel was brought up in full consciousness. Well, I'm going to leave you there for this session, and I look forward to talking to you about a lot more issues about eternal life, how we achieve eternal life, what that means to us, and how the Bible and our Lord Jesus have taught this to us. God bless you, and I look forward to seeing you in our next session. We hope you have been blessed by this message today on a contemporarily relevant Bible topic. Dr. Woodhead has been teaching the Bible for 25 years. He is a pastor, an author, and conference speaker on various biblical subjects. Dr. Woodhead is the dean of the Jewish Studies School at Schofield Seminary. His seminary teaching includes the Old Testament and Biblical Hebrew. He has attended Hebrew University in Jerusalem and a Hebrew College in Massachusetts. Let us know if you have any questions about today's broadcast. We look forward to providing you with continuing Bible messages each week on this station. God bless you. To the land of Zion Next year in Jerusalem The Shana Haba'ah The Yerushalayim Next year in Jerusalem O hero Israel, O Israel here O Lord thy kingdom come Thy will be done next year The Shana Haba'ah The Yerushalayim Next year in Jerusalem